This is Universal Lunch, Out of Office Hours, a limited run live streamed web series on the occasion of Future Spective, an exhibition with events and happenings that demonstrate how design inquiry engages in open ended extra disciplinary exchange. Future Spective runs through December 14th at the Institute of Contemporary Art at the Maine College of Art in Portland, Maine. I'm Jimmy Liu in Austin, Texas. And I'm Gabrielle Esperdi in New York City. Futurespective asks a simple question. What does it mean to rethink the past in the present to point to the future? And each Thursday for the duration of the Futurespective exhibition, we will gather a diverse group of thinkers and makers to kick around answers to this question relative to design, to culture, or to anything else our guests want to discuss. On today's episode, Gabrielle and I finally get a chance to catch up with each other after alternating weeks of being away. And we chat with Bay Area publishing darling Vivian Sming. And then we will also catch up with Nick Liotis, the architect and avian advocate, currently designer in residence at Futurespective, and artist and scholar Matt Soar, our congenial Canadian connection, who is artist in residence at Futurespective this week as well. Gabrielle, hi. Hi, happy Halloween. It's so happy fun Halloween. to be back together after yes. our our various uh, regional travels. Uh, hey, let's start with you. How was the book fair? Oh my gosh, it was so good. Um, I had never been to Vancouver, Canada. Uh, before British Columbia, is that right? Gotcha. I'm like so bad with my Canadian geography. But um, the things I discovered about Vancouver is that um, I don't know if it was just the area we were in, but um, it was near Emily Carr University. Um, but every other restaurant was an Asian restaurant. I was very happy about that. Pacific Rim, my friend. Pacific uh, Rim. Yeah, it was so good. And every other person seemed to be of Asian American descent as well. <laughs> so it was very empowering. Um, the book fair was a great learning experience for us. It was my first time tabling at um, an art book fair. Did you sell stuff? We did. And, you know, the best thing was, uh, like, you know, afterwards, I went with a group of colleagues and... Um, we were kind of doing a retrospective of like our experience. And I think the thing that we learned the most was like how nice it is to be in conversation with people who are into what you're doing and, you know, compliments, like, cause you're just like making stuff in a vacuum sometimes, you know? And so to actually see it out in the world and to be there to see people looking at it was um, amazing. I think that vacuum thing is is um, really important because people don't understand how much almost all of our work is like that. Uh, yeah. They tend to think that because we're in the academy, oh, well, you're constantly in this conversation with your students, but that tends to be so directed that you don't necessarily have the time for these larger open-ended conversations, uh, yeah. which is why going to those kinds of events feeds your soul. It really did. Yeah. And um, I would think Vancouver, too. Uh, lots of green glass out there. A lot of green glass. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm sure Nick will have something to say about all that green glass when we talk to him later uh, on today. Yeah. I'm the, sure birds. The, birds, the birds fly into that. Yeah, uh, we never think about those birds. And, uh, and was the event actually at Emily Carr or was it somewhere else? It was, and it is a very nice facility. But yeah, one of those fabulous, brutalist megastructures in impeccable condition. At least it was the last time I was there. Well, not so impeccable because there was an arsonist that uh, came through. Wow. And, yeah, and burned down like the arts painting studios or something like a week before the art fair. So when we were there, like there were parts of it that were kind of sectioned off. Oh my God, that's amazing. Yeah, it was a little crazy. Was it a disgruntled uh, senior? No, it was like a random, it was like a, a random person, it sounded like. Like, they didn't really have that many details, but it wasn't anyone connected to the university. It wasn't a protest. It was, wow. it was just a random act of violence. 
undoubtedly caused by uh, someone from south of the border. Yeah, yeah of course. Clearly. <laughs> uh, okay, but I want to hear about your adventures. Um, your uh, Is it part of a book? tour an entire oh, yes, tour? The, my global <laughs> book tour exciting um, no in fact the book the book tour was really only um that was only part of it because i had been invited out by uh cincinnati preservation which is a really really active mm -hmm. uh preservation association that has uh done some kind of amazing things in terms of advocacy of the built environment and um, they are interested in this, uh, in one building in, well, among their many interests, um, they've been working to save, uh, this hotel that's right in the center of Cincinnati. It's in really, really bad shape right now. But at the time that it was finished in 1948, it was the most modern hotel in America. Um, and it was this big hotel that opened one of the first ones to open right after world war two was over. Um, and it was designed by Skidmore Owings and Merrill, which was still at the very, very beginning of, uh, of their practice. And the lead designer was um, Natalie Deblois. So it's this incredible modern building uh, designed by someone who would go on to achieve great prominence as a designer of high rises, et cetera. Um, and it's just this moldering ruin uh, in, the middle of, uh, in the middle of Cincinnati. And part of the problem, you would think in our era of boutique hotels, it'd be really easy to figure out how to repurpose it. But uh, mm. one of its most innovative aspects at the time was that it had these two department stores that rose above street level retail and oh. they're windowless because Whoa. they, you know, there was this idea that, well, why do we have windows in department stores? I mean, in some way, department stores <laughs> are like casinos, right? You don't yeah. want people looking out. You want people looking in. <laughs> So, of course, what seemed really innovative at the time now makes the building really difficult mm -hmm. to, re to repurpose because if you were to do something really simple like cut windows into it, then it's not necessarily eligible for historic preservation tax credits, which a project like that needs. So it's a really interesting case study, uh, and it was exciting to be, uh, to be back there. Um, I also had the opportunity to uh, visit uh, the American Sign Museum uh, which oh. is in Cincinnati, uh, started by um, Todd Swarmstead, and I had the opportunity to meet him. This is also apropos of our of uh, our guest Matt Soar. Um, they do an amazing, amazing job of presenting not only the history of signage in North America as a kind of evolution of technology and craft, but also the evolution of graphic design that is implicit uh, in, uh, in the design of the signage. It was just a, a, an amazing thing. Unlike the neon boneyard out in Las Vegas where, that's the, where the signs are just kind of laying on the ground, these are all yeah. installed and working. Oh. And so you walk through what was a, a, um, a parachute factory <laughs> during the Korean War. So this big, long uh, industrial uh. space that uh, is just filled with signs, uh, from the simplest neon signs to, um, to painting on glass. Mm. Uh, it's really, really, um, amazing. Uh, and they're in the midst of beginning fundraising for an expansion. They want to have a study center. Uh, so shout out to the American sign museum in mm. Cincinnati because they are really doing, uh, work that anyone who's interested in, uh, in, graphic design, in environmental design, in cultural history, um, should run, not walk. Uh, <laughs> and are the signs from a particular era mostly, or it, does it span? It spans, like? uh, it spans the 20th century. Okay. Uh, and and uh, Todd is something of a kind of the Indiana Jones of signs because he's always getting in his car or taking his flatbed uh, to some hot spot where a sign needs to be rescued um, and brings it back. And so they do, they do go, there are wooden type forms from the 19th century. Mm -hmm. um, interestingly, they did one uh, really fabulous installation that that's a kind of little bit, um, not quite full size, let's say a sort of seven eighth scale main street where you have these kind of typical storefronts that allow you to see the signs in their original locations. And to create that, he, did, he 
used signs from the collection, but he also brought in contemporary um, sign makers to f- mm-hmm. sort of fill in the missing pieces. So it's a wonderful kind of um, collecting old signs, but also mm-hmm. keeping uh, this level of craft alive. And I think that that makes it quite um, engaging for visitors. And frankly, I think for people, for researchers as well, I was trying to encourage him to to start having uh, designers in residence. Oh, uh, uh, what a good uh, idea, right? Like just bring someone in and, you know, have at it and see uh, see what, what results. Um, so that was really, really thrilling. Um, and we sold a bunch of books, so that was good too. Yes, that is always a good feeling, right? Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, um, I can't wait to continue to talk about your book um, over the next few episodes. I have so many questions Absolutely. to ask you about it as well. Um, I've always had a soft spot in my heart for the Arby's signs. Like, do you know what I'm talking about? It's like this I do giant indeed. hat. Yeah. Yes. And, you know, they're closing them down left and right. I and, know. Yeah. yeah. He has one. Uh, he has one at the American Sign Museum. Uh, and uh, it is it is quite grand. I've always assumed yeah. that it was a, that it's a, um, uh, it's a kind of caricature of a 10 gallon hat. Yeah. That's what yes. I always assumed. Yes. Uh-huh. Uh, rather than it being like a, a weird bowler hat or something. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there's like one outside of a closed Arby's, like kind of right as you drive into my neighborhood. And I mm-hmm. always want to be like, can I just take it? put it in my yard <laughs> I know they, I, well yeah in Texas they may not have zoning about that kind of stuff <laughs> yeah. no, it's, it's a lawless land out here <laughs> well actually right now our street name is there there's a petition to change the spelling of our street name huh. like there's a contingency of people trying to change our street name from man chaka to m-e-n chaka to be more historically correct Mm -hmm. and there's we're and we're part of a contingency of people supporting a website called leave manchac alone (laughs) because we don't want to have to change our address like you know because you have to go through all those steps Mm -hmm. of like change yeah oh it's like nobody wants to do that what's the uh i assume it's a native american word it is is no it's like a historic person like a general or something and like through time it's gotten misspelled allegedly allegedly like the history is a little iffy like the historical documents so we're like no no everybody well the easier way to deal with that is to just put a a brown sign underneath indicating (sighs) that it had another name yeah right like don't don't make me change all my addresses. Well, and also there's there's a kind of absurdity to just doing one sign or one street. I mean, yes. some places have, I know in Acadia National Park, they are restoring the entire trail system, attempting to go back to its historic names because they think that's important, but it's a they're doing it across the whole system, not just one, one random street. Yes. Well, we're also getting rid of um, Confederate street names Mm -hmm. in Austin, you know, so that's also another thing, but that I support. Yes. support Yes. Well, again, because if this is just an errant corruption, uh, going down that road, we'd end up changing. uh, I can't even begin to imagine. I say sitting here on the Island of Manhattan, which we'd (laughs) we'd have to begin to refer to Manhattan again. Um, Exactly. (laughs) We'll see. (laughs) Um, okay, um, I, let's get started yes, on indeed. our interview. Um, I am so excited for our guest today. Um, our first guest today is Vivian Sming. Uh, Sming uses text, image, and new genres to engage in post-human discourse and is committed to fostering arts dialogue through publications, programming, and alternative pedagogical formats. She is currently Head of Publications, Education, and Programs at Art Practical and co-founded Nonsensical, a journal of critical and experimental writing by visual artists. 
Sming designs and publishes a wide range of artist books, zines, and editions through her publishing studio, Sming Sming Books, working in collaboration with artists whose works and ideas inform design, material, and printing choices. Vivian holds a BA in art from UCLA and an MFA from CalArts and was a 2016-2017 fellow at Yerba Buena Center for the Arts. In 2018, Sming Sming Books received the Shannon Michael Kane Memorial Award from Printed Matter, a very prestigious thing. Sming Sming Books has been collected by over 50 libraries, museums, and universities, nation and worldwide, including the Getty, the Whitney, the Met, MoMA, and SF MoMA. Vivian Sming, welcome to Universal Lunch. Hi, everyone. Hi, Jimmy. Thank you for having me. <laughs> yeah, so happy yeah. to be in conversation with you today. Also, happy Halloween. I put on my um, art book publisher <laughs> costume. <laughs> my endless edition. Right. It's like the outfit you have to wear while trying to be comfortable be- sitting behind your booth all day for an yeah. entire weekend. <laughs> Yes, I just experienced that, um, and it was it was fun but hard, right? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. What, was this your first time at, at the um, <laughs> like on the other side of the table? Um, at an art book fair, like I think I've okay. done like maybe like a zine fest and a smaller kind of thing, like you know, like a uh, like in our city before, but first time at like yeah, an art book fair. <laughs> um. Okay, we're going to start with something easy. Um, I'm I'm not sure it's actually time for lunch today for you, but um, (laughs) tell us what are what did you have for lunch? If you had early lunch or breakfast, um, or what you are looking forward to having for lunch? Oh oh my goodness! Um, It is eight in the morning here, so I have not had lunch, um, and I don't eat breakfast unfortunately because um, it's my kind of person. Oh my gosh. Yeah, I don't eat yeah. breakfast either. Yeah, so I have my tea here. Um, but um, lunch is something I am notoriously terrible at in terms of, um, you know, I am always skip it. <laughs> and I have to be reminded by my coworkers to um, take a break and get lunch, which usually we'll go and get poke. <laughs> okay. So, yeah. Mm-hmm, Favorite mm-hmm. lunch item. Yeah. Mm-hmm. An infusion of protein. Yeah. <laughs> and there's, you know. Um, some veggies in there too, so it feels feels healthy. <laughs> How is food related to your uh, the arc of your productivity on a given day? Um, I think if I, I think I mean I really enjoy food. I am Taiwanese, and Taiwanese people love absolutely love food. So I think we could you know we could eat food a lot, but in terms of um, productivity. I wish I could go without it. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Same, um, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I would like it to just be like this leisurely activity, but not something I actually have to do. <laughs> yeah. Interesting how we, uh, how we sort of wish things were the way they are. We wish things were a certain way, but have difficulty creating the space to allow that to happen. Yeah. Although, I mean, I feel like some people feel that way about sleep. And I have to say that I am a person that does enjoy sleep. And Oh, uh, my gosh. It's, yeah. It's, and it's necessary. for. <laughs> so I would not opt out of sleep. But I would opt out of food and showers, I think. <laughs> <laughs> but again, your coworkers might have something to say about that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, well, okay. So we're so since you haven't had breakfast because it's not part of your daily ritual, uh, and we know that poke might be on the horizon, uh, let's ask a, a, a perhaps more um, uh, probing question. One of the things that we're really interested in at Universal Lunch is, uh, of course, the work that you are producing currently and the work that you have produced. Um, but we're really interested in the ideas that feed that work. So Jimmy and I are hoping we could ask you to trace a line backwards through 
your practice, your education, and, and, and perhaps kind of early childhood to unpack formative experiences, uh, whether those are people or institutions, anything that shaped uh, what you maybe want to call your particular school of thought um, that, that somehow has informed your perspective as a, an artist, designer, or publisher. Really? Um, so I usually like to begin that trajectory through the question of um, where does art reside um, and thinking about where did or does art start, especially for myself. Um, and I think for me, it's really a thought driven process. I don't, um, you know, I, I think of philosophy as um, an action and thought as an action rather than um, something you can, you know, just go back and study to. But I'm very interested in that um, active form of thinking and thought. Um, so for me, it really does begin just with, you know, childhood, spending a lot of time in front of my my closet mirror, you know, <laughs> thinking and pondering about the existence of like meaning of life and existence uh, while other, other children were playing. Um, not the healthiest <laughs> at all, but, um, but for me, that's, I think, where that formative experience really, really came about. And I think art, I, when I learned about um, art and, you know, started practicing art, I was doing photography and design. I was, you know, um, designing websites on my computer at home, but, um, for art, it was really just a way to put some of those that thought into practice or into a, a you know um, a physical form, um, and um, it was never something that I felt like I was good at necessarily. But it was just like the only option that I felt like I could do. Um, so, um, so yeah, in terms of like thinking through thought. Um, I did go to UCLA, which is a research-based university, and those interdisciplinary conversations were really important to me. Um, took classes in the anthropology department. Very, I'm basically very interested in the question of human and have always been um, in terms of who is uh, considered a human, how did the category of human even come about, how is it a, a um, category that has been, you know, a line that has been uh, shifted depending on, you know, who's in power as like a tactical maneuver. Um, so those questions continue to, um, you know, we'll probably die with those questions unanswered. <laughs> but those are, you know, those are things that I'm just obsessed with constantly. And um, so for me, art is, is this very internal practice. Um, and I think I started participating in discourse, um, going to conference, academic conferences as an artist, um, which is really fun and interesting. <laughs> I highly recommend it. But like talking to scientists and um, kind of recognizing that they also, you know, they felt like there was a gap in terms of um, how the public understood science, especially, you know, you know what we're dealing with, with um, a lot of climate change. And, you know, a lot of that has the research has been done and to effectively um, make that into policy was like the, the thing that they were struggling with. Um, and I think a lot um, that can be said with um, art as well. Um, there's, um, you know, a, a lack of understanding um, in terms of education and, and the public of what art is and, and what artists do. Um, and I think through that conversation, I realized that um it really isn't the responsibility of artists to provide that um, knowledge or to make their work accessible. I think as artists, we're like, oh, should I, you know, make, you know, you know, the idea of like um, dumbing down your work um, um, to fit different audiences, I think is, um, you know, art is about freedom and freedom of expression. So, you know, you, as an artist, you really should be able to just do whatever you want. Um, and, um, yeah, so those are, those are just some of the things, <laughs> you know, I'm thinking about and, um, that have really led me to discourse books are historically the tool of discourse. Um, and so here I am. <laughs> uh, was, uh, was two questions related to both yeah. art 
and um, the notion of uh, the kind of category of human. Uh, was was art a part of your kind of childhood experiences when you were gazing in that, you know, gazing in the in the mirror? Uh, and were there um, other beings around who didn't fit into conventional categories of human that you were kind of contemplating when you were a young person? Yeah, I mean, to answer that last question, I think there was this moment that replays in my head and also just in my work, um, this moment that I think about a lot, which is like sitting on um, the sidewalk, probably as like a seven-year-old, we probably learned about atoms and things like that. <laughs> and, like there's this tiny, tiny red spider that just like strolls by. And I just become so terrified, like just horrified that, by the possibility that you're like crushing and killing organisms all the time that are invisible to you. Um, so I think that, I mean, I feel like that's, that's, um, I don't know if scientists have a name for that moment, you know, in sort of self actualization. Um, but, um, but that moment has really been like seared in my head. Um, and I, I would say that art had always been, and that has have always been like parallel in a sense where um, um, I wasn't necessarily a very artistic, um, you know, child. I wasn't like drawing or, or painting or anything like that. But um, it wasn't until high school that I took up more ph photography classes. And um, but then after UCLA and reading about, <laughs> about photo theory, you're like, I'm never taking a photo again. <laughs> it's just ethically wrong. <laughs> So, yeah. So Wait, where did you? Really been, uh -huh. Sorry, where did you grow up? Where geographically? Oh, yeah, Bay, the Bay Area. So okay. I'm here still. Yeah, I uh, moved to LA and then moved back. So, yeah, we've got the fires going on right now. Yeah, my voice is a little raspy. <laughs> was art a thing that was encouraged in your households? No. <laughs> um, I think I w well, in my household, I mean, my parents really didn't care, but I think, um, you know, I did grow up in a, in a very um, large, like, immigrant community. And, um, you know, we are here in Silicon Valley in, near tech, and that is really the way that people thought, like, that's, that's your career, um, you know, tech and business. Um, and... Um, I just w always wanted to go against the grain. I was very angsty as a kid. I know it's hard to imagine now, but I would throw things <laughs> and lash out. Um, and one of the, the ways was like, oh, I'm not going to be smart. Like, screw that. I don't want to like, um, you know, in terms of like book smart and, um, and I don't want to, um, you know, I don't care about grades. I don't, you know, care about school, anything like that. Um, and so uh, UC UCLA was actually the only UC I applied to because it was like all the Asian Americans are applying to UCs. I'm not going to do that. Um, but I think you know after after I did um, get in and, and take classes, it was like right. I'm not you know like it's it's fine to have an education. <laughs> like you need to be able to vocalize what it is you're you know you're propelling against. So. Um, yeah, so I think art was was part of probably one of those categories of like, oh, nobody else is going to be doing this, so I'm going to be, <laughs> yeah, well, mm -hmm. I'll do it. <laughs> yeah. So I want to move to um, a conversation about um, contemporary independent publishing, um, and maybe we want to get to talking about your experience starting up Sming Sming Books. Um, so. But your day job, your day job, we all have a day job, um, is at Art Practical, which is uh, a visual arts publishing organization run out of California College of the Arts. Um, and then presumably at night, uh, you're running your own imprint, Sming Sming Books. Um, so as someone who's kind of arguably like in the thick of all this, what what is your take on the the independent publishing scene, if we can call it that, right now? Um, well, it's very exciting. I will say, I think, mm -hmm. um, especially the art book fairs. There, you know, we always joke that it's like 
it's like the internet done right, you know, <laughs> where um, people are connecting through the internet and you're uh, making information available on the internet, um, creating communities there, and then you're meeting up in person and saying hi. <laughs> That's how we met. <laughs> yeah, awesome. is that it was a yeah. kind of a cool feeling, right, to see you IRL. <laughs> yeah, totally. Um, and so, um, yeah, so all those, you know, in terms of my um, interest in discourse and and that um, making art assess- accessible in some ways, um, um, I think those are the two, you know, with art practical, it's a very different form through arts writing and through criticism. Um, and then um, we also publish, um, you know, we, we do podcasts and books and things like that. And then with um, art books, for me, it's really about making um, an artwork that you can live with, take at home, has this like immediacy to it. Um, and it's just really exciting, the range. And I don't think we, you know, I think there's just, we're seeing so many different art book fairs all over the world. <laughs> Wild. Um, and I don't think we're even at the peak of it yet. Um, and okay. Yeah. I don't think we're even there yet. We haven't seen what people got. <laughs> and it's yeah, cool because it, Mm-hmm. Sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, it's it's cool because a lot of these people are, like, working in, you know, like, I'm living in the suburbs. People, uh, other folks are living in more rural areas, not traditionally not art centers. And um, I think it is a way of making that, you know, fostering that sustainability because, um, you know, it's just becoming more un- unaffordable to live in those um, city centers, especially here in the Bay. So, the, the fact that you can connect with folks who are living in, um, you know, all over the nation in these small, smaller towns, I think will become a, a more sustainable way of like having an, an art practice and art community. Yeah. I'm fascinated by um, the way you started this talking about the, the, the sort of the internet, the way we thought it might be, or perhaps going back to the earliest ideas of what the web could be in terms of in terms of making those connections, but it seems really interesting that um, what you're talking about is a let's call it a kind of polycentric future, right? Where there are these, it's not just the centers, many, many, many centers. Everybody's out there making books, but then in terms of the art fair, it still requires this, in a way, this old-fashioned coming together and and handing to, if you will. Um, I'm wondering why, why do you think that part of it is so, is so important as opposed to kind of some sort of digital representation that someone could then purchase in a kind of conventional online store format? What do you see as the, as so critical about the fair structure itself? Mm -hmm. Um, Well, I think it's very akin to just experiencing things in person and physically. Um, I, um, I written an essay that was basically on the user experience of books and just like books are a genius technology, right? They've been, they've just existed for so long and, um, and but there's the idea of like, you know, the touch and feel and, and there's students who are citing like the smell of books as like the reason they would rather, you know, have a book textbook rather than a digital book. Um, and so there is just something that is so fundamentally, um, great about like how the book was just created and invented and how it functions. It just works. Um, nothing can really, I think, replace it. Um, so I think there's that. And then, you know, the idea of like bodies teaming together, (laughs) I mean, it is, it always blows my mind that there's like 40,000 people that are coming in, they're sweaty and, and they're just like. Um, you know, it's really physically uncomfortable, actually, but they're there for and showing up for books. Um, there's also the magic of discovery. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think a lot of things online now are curated through algorithms. Um, you know, the app store even shows you there's people whose job it is to just um, or, you know, to program an algorithm to, to show you what you'd like. And I think those fairs are a way to break out of that a little bit in terms of like discovering something completely new. Um, and yeah, that's, I, I don't think we've, um, I think that early internet, that there was that discovery and now it's becoming so refined and fine tuned that, um, it's missing some of that. And so this in-person thing is really bringing that part of it back. 
Mm -hmm. It's the, it's about those chance adjacencies. Like when you're reading the physical newspaper and you happen to see that thing next to it, it's like what could yeah. be at the next table. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So there's a, that kind of thrill of discovery, which, you know, in some ways does take us back to that earliest moment of both the production of books, but then the organizing of books, because it was mm -hmm. about proximities and adjacencies and, and the way in which um, various thinkers chose to organize their mm -hmm. books. Uh, and do you see in this kind of, in, in what I, I think you're clearly articulating as a, a sort of proliferation of the artist book, um, and that the, almost the intimacy of the, uh, the, let's say the acquiring and the experience of the artist book, I wonder if it, if it starts to come close to something like a devotional practice, um, almost like a medieval book of hours or something like that. Uh, do you think that that, that kind of intimate relationship between the, the, the person and the book um, is a part of this, the, the, the moment that you're talking about? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know that I would characterize as like a devotional. I think it's very personal in mm -hmm. terms of how one wants to experience that. But I think like art, you know, some people have that experience with art and revisiting that piece of art over and over again. Um, I think there's a quality to that that can happen, but doesn't necessarily, it's not necessary. Um, you know, you can leave it on the shelf too. And then, you know, you know, five or 10 years later, pick it up and be like, wow, this is the book I needed, right? <laughs> in this moment. Um, so I think there's also, you know, and I also do enjoy the democracy of books, you know, you know, behind your, <laughs> your, um, <laughs> your city. yeah, just like all those books. Um, I love that the different thoughts they can be totally like contrasting thoughts um, and works are just like sitting next to each other. And there's no, in that moment, at least there's no like hierarchies, you know, uh, other than, you know, the market price for, <laughs> for right. certain things, but um, just physically they're not, there's no hierarchical. Yeah. Um, they, they, they peacefully coexist. So your communist manifesto yeah. can be next to so, the elected speeches of Ronald Reagan. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's something so beautiful about that. And um, I think that, again, that used to happen on the internet, but now it's um, kind of being siloed. Vivian, do you think about like the, you know, when when we go to these fairs um, and you get these books and, you know, a lot of them are in small editions, um, they're not uh, they don't have ISBNs, they're hard to archive, catalog, keep track of the distribution. Like, how do you think uh, the life of these art books plays out over time? Like, wh what happens because they are in existence now in the world, but we don't have any way of really um, understanding where, where they live outside of the fair? Yeah, I mean, I feel like it's it's almost uh, in that way because they're they're short run, and I do like to tell people that like they're limited edition because we can't afford to make more. <laughs> you know, it's, it, you know, the galleries, yeah. you know, they're all gonna tell you that it's just this, like you know rare object, but that's just like a marketing thing. Lies. <laughs> <laughs> but it's really because we can't afford it you know I mean of course the idea of books is about distribution um but um but because um everyone's just working with limited resources um it you know will just result in um fewer books being made and um and yeah I always think of it like you know like you're throwing a book into the forest, right? Is anyone going to even look at it or pick it up or where, where does it go? Um, but, um, but I think that's part of, you know, what we're talking about in terms of that, the magic of the experience of discovery, you know, the fact that it really, you know, some of these aren't, don't exist online in any form. Um, I think that adds to this, um, layer of culture that I think we really need that's not just solely digital. Um, yeah. It's almost as if we the, the proliferation of the artist books in this profoundly quote unquote digital moment reminds us of why we needed books in the first place. It's mm -hmm. like that there's that connection. I wonder too, you know Benjamin's um, essay about unpacking his library. Mm. Uh, I wonder if that... Um, if that has relevance in the in the realm of artist books, 
Um, and maybe, maybe it's, it's about any library, um, any collection that you kind of put away for whatever reason and, and unpack. Have you, have you had that kind of experience where you're moving your books around or moving a studio where suddenly there's that, just that moment of, of personal discovery of someone else's work or your own? Um, well, <laughs> it's funny because prior to moving back to the Bay, I was a minimalist in the sense of like, I only owned, like, I got rid of pretty much everything, um, all my books, um, and... Oh, owned, how like, could you? <laughs> two pair of pants, you know, really, I was living in this tiny studio, and then um, moved back, to, you know, my husband's um, childhood home, and so now we have, <laughs> like, a giant, you know, we got the library, we got the uh, vinyl collection, um, you know, it's uh, proliferating, and here I am making books, <laughs> So I think that question is hard for me. <laughs> um, but what I, I will have to say, what I do enjoy is looking through other people's libraries. You know, when I when I moved um, into this house and, and looking through um, my husband's collection that he had as a teenager, you know, and just it, it really is just such, such a personal thing. And um, and. They have one of those Amazon bookstores here at you know, uh, <laughs> the local mall. <laughs> yeah. And when you go in, it just it that it it's sorted by um, uh, best selling. So what you see on it's been organized very much in, in the same way you um, you would experience walking into or going on online to Amazon.com, where it shows you the top five. Um, and then related, if you like this, you might also like these, <laughs> but it's just so impersonal. <laughs> um, so I really, I just really love um, just seeing other people's libraries and um, my own like library. It's, it's getting bigger, but you know, it is very research focused and um, yeah, you know, on all the posting and stuff. So it's not, um, I haven't quite gotten there yet where um, it, it's because my, my grandma, <laughs> um is uh, I feel like she's a hoarder so um I was like once I saw that I was like oh my gosh I need to get rid of everything so I yeah I'm still you know have this like contested relationship with objects and I know it's very ironic because you know we're um making I do believe in making books <laughs> but um I think that's but you you send them away right people <laughs> I send them away but I also think it is the, uh, one of the least impactful forms of art that I could be creating um, in mm. terms of, you know, the idea of being an artist and creating these large sculptures that will um, um, be, I don't, I, you know, in terms of like the, the, the uh, geological um, layers like that will remain compacted there just doesn't, doesn't make sense. So I do, I do love that books are, still ephemeral and they're just gonna you know they can disappear and it's okay <laughs> or maybe what we need is the you know those warehouses that used to exist on the periphery of so many cities called book depositories we need an art book depository uh where almost in a, in a or maybe this is a pr precisely what you're arguing we don't need um <laughs> That idea that, you know, one of everything would somehow end end up in there uh, mm -hmm. to create this this um, almost aggressively analog record in our in our digital moment. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot that's been the surprising thing about um, Spring Spring Books. Like I didn't un uh, expect for it to end up in these museum collections just because like, um, you know, I, I, yeah, I just didn't know that there was that interest there. But yeah. Um, I think there are people who are looking for art books and, and collecting them and archiving them mm -hmm. um, and uh, creating also alternative archives. So, um, yeah, there's people that are <laughs> that are putting them in boxes and safe. <laughs> well, this is a good. Um, I want to bring up, um, since you're talking about people collecting your books, um, I want to bring up one of your books that is currently in its second edition. Um, which is White Gaze by uh, G-A-Z-E, not G-A-Y-S. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, White, white G-A-Z-E. Not that there's anything wrong with yeah. White Gaze, just Yeah, kidding. they're lovely. I have one at home. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, White Gaze, uh, uh, it's a book uh, commenting on uh, National Geographic um, by Michelle Dizon and Viet Lee. 
Um, can you tell us a little bit about the premise of this book and the process of making it? And it's, um, I, I know you maybe are faced with a little bit of controversy from National Geographic itself. So yeah, please uh, tell our audience about uh, White Gaze. Yeah. Um, so I actually have it right here. Um, so this is the book. Okay. Um, in terms of design, I mean, this was very easy for me to design because I it was it's literally a size of a National Geographic. But um, so Michelle Dizon had um, gone to this estate sale in um, Altadena, I believe, in this um, predominantly white suburb of LA, and um, found this archive of National Ge Geographics from. Um, the 50s and 60s mostly and she just like left it sitting in her studio she was just like I don't really know what to do with this <laughs> like um, um, but after she started looking through them she you know she, I think she realized how important National Geographic was to her own formation in terms of like as um, Im an immigrant or children of immigrant we are um, National Geographic is still like the way that we experience what the world is and so we're like understanding ourselves through this lens that is quite you know obviously riddled with racism and colonialism and um so she she wanted to unpack that and so um basically she just took um scanned in these pages from national geographic and redacted text to create these new narratives um so you have um pages that say um you know under here it says um the natives have lost all knowledge um so it's a way of like redactive i guess it's like redactive poetry um mm -hmm. and then um viet um viet's um poetry is on this brown paper and it just adds to the sort of ryth more rhythmic or lyrical quality while you're reading through it and he does also include um more of that background in terms of, uh, you know, U.S. history and um, in, in imperialism. Um, but yeah, so we we published this right, I think the month before Nat Geo came out with their um, race issue, where they like, you know, had this editorial piece where they're, they're admitting to their racist history. Um, and um, so that was kind of a, that was already a very interesting <laughs> moment for us to like be launching at the same time. And then later, you know, the book sold out pretty quickly. And then after um, a year, um, so earlier this year, uh, we were um, contacted by their sales department, um, asked, inquiring about licensing fees, whether or not we had um, licensed um, those images um, and, um, you know, we were using it under, or Michelle was using it under fair use, um, so we had not. Um, but <laughs> I think it, it does open this other conversation around um, um, appropriation and um, property. So it's not just that in these images um, depict what is the white gaze, but it also, that gaze is also one already of um, ownership. Um, so it wasn't just, you know, the, the original questions of the project were really about, you know, who, um, who gets to make images of the world. Um, but then, you know, this opens up the question of like, who gets to make images of the world, but also who gets to own those images of the world and then profit off of those images. Um, you know, certainly the folks depicted in these um, images are not compensated. So, um, and also who creates the rules and laws around um, how um, images can be used. Um, so those are all yeah, questions that we're dealing with that I think, honestly, I think it can only be, uh, you know, people talk about theory and practice and, um, and by through publishing, it really has become like the theory has really become practice. Mm -hmm. You know, there's stake there in terms of um, like, actual <laughs> you know um you know there's monetary um a monetary stake and and um by publishing it you know by creating an artwork it might not have faced these questions but by publishing um um it has um activated um the questions in the artwork so i think i think that is really interesting in terms of what publishing as an act can do um, yeah. And 
what position did they, I mean, it's interesting to me that it was the sales department rather than say the legal department. Mm. Uh, what position did, have they continued to take over the question of fair use? Yeah, so we haven't, they, it's been forwarded to their legal department, so we haven't heard back um, from them. Um, yeah, so we'll, we're, it's, we're gonna wait and see <laughs> what so that, that also raises a question that um, I hadn't really thought about before, that National Geographic owns its own photographic archive and mm -hmm. continues to license it itself, as opposed to, say, Time Life having you know, sold it. Um, to a commercial entity, which then attempts to extract money from every poor person who wants to use one of their famous images. Uh, I mean, and it's interesting too, because does now National Geographic, um, is it still its own thing or is it owned by a publishing conglomerate? I actually don't know that question. Yeah, or the answer to that question. Yeah. I think they might be owned by a conglomerate. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I've don't quote me on that. I feel like we need some <laughs> fact checkers in the background yeah. Yeah. that we can send a message to. <laughs> but it's also really interesting. I think part of part of what is implicit in this project is that the the original, let's call it archive, was a chance discovery. And so the whole project itself is built on someone else giving National Geographic a certain kind of cultural seriousness. In other words, that it a, those piles of them that remained around in that person's house long enough, and maybe it was just a simple hoarder house, or it was that, oh, these have value somehow, yeah, which of course definitely. just is folded right back into the question of, white, of the white gaze. It's really yeah. interesting. Okay. Yeah. And, you know, that idea of discovery for me was like one of the most poignant thing about like reading my copy of White Gaze was, you know, um, sort of the discussion of just the moment of becoming aware that there is a white gaze for uh, for Michelle and for Viet that um, and for I, I think a lot of non-white people <laughs> growing up is that you don't know that the gaze that you know that you are always constantly experiencing is of whiteness um, or through whiteness um, and so I think that's what's the most interesting discussion that's going on in this book for me is like yeah like that moment where you're breaking out of that way of seeing um, yeah, and if in the second edition, um, Michelle has a new essay called The Sediments of Whiteness, and, um, and she talks about how, um, you know, that, that white gaze doesn't only belong to white people, that, um, mm -hmm. that it is something that in, you know, looking at these um, National Geographic as a, as a child, you're also, you're separating yourself from your own culture, your own people. Um, mm -hmm. There's this... Um, example of like oh this is what we we moved away from you know um that you're <laughs> folks can represent so i think yeah um there's a lot um definitely i think people have a very personal relationship to nat geo you know it's it's yeah. the magazine where you're like oh yeah as a kid if you're doing collages or something that's what you um you know because yeah everyone show. had a stack of them laying around yeah. and yeah. you know like yeah i'll be you know i'll when I first got a copy of it, I was like, sit in public a little bit and like hold it open and read it. <laughs> and yeah, I got some looks. I got yeah, some looks. Yeah, but it also had the power of producing discomfort when mm -hmm. you realized whatever your kind of socioeconomic or racial position, you were looking at especially black and brown bodies frequently revealed in a position of cultural um, subjugation, even if not otherwise subjugation, particularly with respect to um, bodies that were clothed and unclothed. Uh, mm -hmm. And so that, that the discomfort that also accompanied the looking at the National Geographic in the dentist office or wherever, wherever you were. Um, but I think what's so important about this is the, the way in which what is ultimately being revealed is that the f the way the world is framed, and I know you guys know this, but I think it's just mm. sometimes we need to remind ourselves that the world, the way the world is framed is created, is constructed, yes. and that everyone comes to that realization at a different moment, and how important it is for 
the tools to exist for young people to have that moment of revelation. Um, because otherwise you end up in therapy for way too long. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Like I wish someone had told me, I wish someone had told me sooner, you know, like, yeah, it was very, very, uh, eye opening to have that discovery on your own as a young person of color. Um, yeah, I think it's just, it's also just interesting how their, you know, the editorial vision and mission is like misaligned with the the economic realities and they don't quite match up and to, um, and hopefully they will realize that to actually, you know, it's not just about calling out your, your past, but that um, it's about implementing a more equitable um, structure. So, um, yeah. We will, we will see what happens. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, I suppose it's also about the recognition, and this kind of perhaps circles back to this moment of, of uh, art book fairs. It's the recognition that we are, in fact, citizens of the world, right? So the, the, the least benign part of National Geographic is that it gives people an awareness of uh, the sort of the global, if you will, um, which is precisely what this proliferating network of, uh, of art book fairs does. Uh, and, uh, so do you want to, um, uh, can you tell us a little bit about what you're working on now and, and what's happening in the future as, uh, as you continue to make, make books and make art? Yeah. Um, well, I just finished up designing three books this month, so I'm like a whole bunch. Ah, okay. Yeah. Amazing. So, but I, things that are in the works, um, uh, this artist, Jimena Sarno, and I have been, um, trying to make a record for a very long time, so that'll be my first. Uh, record. <laughs> um, I love different formats um, or just being an amateur at things. <laughs> so, um, so I'm looking, um, really looking forward to that. Um, Wait, a record that you yourself will be a, on or that you're designing? Um, we're putting together. So she's a sound artist. She okay. creates sculptures that are also activated through sound. Um, and um, so we're part of that is the recording of, um, of the sound, but um, thinking through how to also make that into a book somehow um, without it being very com- overly complicated in terms of, um, you know, like I, I don't quite make coffee table books. They're always like straddling the line of like a zine and like artwork, I would say. Um, so, um, yeah, so we're thinking through that and that that should be um, finished next spring. Yeah. And it will be available at our at our local uh, vinyl store. <laughs> well, we'll see. I mean, anyone? Yeah, I I don't know about uh, yeah. If there's a, if there's a place that just uh, you know uh, specializes in sound art on vinyl <laughs> in person, you'd uh, be surprised. Probably, yeah. you'd be surprised once you start asking. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Austin probably has one on every other corner. Me too. <laughs> Um, I actually had a question for you all like if you felt that because I've been thinking about a different like an alternative to um, art book fairs like that there has to be a different thing activity um, because they are I think they are getting to a point where people are just like you know there's so many people and it's not necessarily the ideal experience to um to experience um, an art book. Um, have you, do you all know of any models or events or activities that, that you know, can showcase objects um, um, in person, but isn't there? Yeah. You know, a number of years ago, um, Adrian Herman, who is an artist who's actually um, based uh, in Portland um, uh, and teaches at the Maine College of Art, she had a project uh, where they had a truck. And it really was, I mean, this was sort of pre-food truck era, uh, but they they did use a, a mobile art truck uh, and just drove it around to various kinds of events in order to showcase objects and make them accessible to the public. And it, I mean, when I look back on it now, after let's say 15 years of trucks being, you know, pop up X on the back of the truck, um, it seems incredibly prescient, but also astonishing that more people haven't done that. 
Um, we can outfit mm. Trump for anything. I mean, so that to me seems like one that has a lot of potential, assuming that it's an uh, electric truck or uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> something that's not kind of adding to the uh, adding to the uh, environmental burden. I mean, we're all flying in, you know, it's like yeah. there, so. Yeah. Um, you know, Vivi, I've just, like, in recent years been um, obsessed with the idea of a showroom. Um, you know, like, I feel like in, uh, I, I, Gabrielle, you might have, be able to help me out with this, like, a, a year, like, I think, I think, like, 50s in America, there were lots of showrooms for things, and, like, that idea of coming into a space where you can um, experience a thing, look at it, that the space is kind of set up for you just to look, um, seems interesting to me, uh, because, you know, I, I feel like we see, I've seen, um, a lot of kind of reading rooms pop up or like, um, alternative libraries pop up. And it's like a space that you can just go and look at these people's collections of stuff without the, the pressure or the, um, the, uh, expectation of, uh, making a monetary exchange mm -hmm. um, because you know you can always get things online but that experience of looking at books is it's hard right it's hard at a book fair because you're like always in a row of like three people deep at your, <laughs> at your booth and then like everyone's like jostling to get in and then you can't yeah. really have a real conversation with people unless it's like a lull and then like uh, it's just it's so hard yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I feel like there hasn't been, you know, I think the gallery space is too, it feels too precious. And like library, you know, I think people are going into libraries looking for specific information. So yeah, I, I, I yeah, I'm certain there's going to be a new form because um, I think we're, we're at that time where <laughs> I don't know how much longer. We can, right. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. Vivian Sming. Thank you so much for being on Universal Lunch with us today. It has been a pleasure to talk to you, to be in a longer conversation with you than we can have at an art book fair table. Yeah. <laughs> yes, thank you so much. It was delightful. Yeah, thank you, Bo. Yeah. Thank you. Enjoy your lunch or not lunch. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, um, uh, we are now uh, moving on to our what we like to call our fun and games segment, uh, which uh, I think we, <laughs> we gave it that title just to indicate that we were bringing on um, more than one guest. Uh, and that we were hoping that they would engage in a, in a kind of stimulating dialogue with each other. Uh, and for this week's fun and game segment, we're joined by Nick Liadis and uh, Matt Soar, uh, both of whom are currently um, in residence at the Main College of Art and the Institute for Contemporary Art uh, as part of Design Inquiry's uh, Future Spective. Um, Nick and Matt, welcome. Uh, Thank you. Thanks. Nick, uh, Nick is a cross-disciplinary thinker working at the interface of architecture and avian conservation biology. Trained as an architect, uh, Nick currently balances a professional practice with teaching at Carnegie Mellon and at Chatham. Um, in his work, I think, as we'll find out, um, Nick is, is defining a new approach to architecture by expanding its parameters towards the natural world, towards bird life in particular. Um, he's expanded this research with appointments at bird observatories and avian research centers in California and in Pennsylvania. And these experiences have given him a real insight into the struggles that birds face when they encounter North American cities, um, particularly tall and, and glass skin buildings. And this perspective has led Nick to promote healthy landscapes uh, across the multitude of environments that birds traverse as they migrate. Um, from forests to woodlands to uh, to urban settings, uh, and we're also joined by Matt Soar, who is an intermediary. Uh, inter, 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 he may be intermediary. <laughs> yeah. um, he's an intermedia artist, uh, experimental filmmaker, scholar, and writer, based at Concordia University in Montreal. Uh, Matt's work is located at the intersections of residual and emergent media forms and practices. Um, he's written extensively and uh, brilliantly about graphic design, visual communication, and, and cultural production. Uh, and he is co-founder and director of the Montreal Signs Project, which is a growing collection of commercial and civic signs that are on permanent exhibition at Concordia. 
his web documentary, Sign Makers of Montreal, was launched online in, uh, in 2018. And he's also at work on a project called Lost Leaders, uh, which is an archival uh, interpretive exploration of the histories of U.S. Canadian film leader standards. Uh, the leaders, of course, are those things at the very beginning of a, of, a, of a role of film, a canister of film. Matt's creative work has screened at venues across North America, from Montreal to San Francisco and points in between. Matt and Nick, uh, welcome to Universal Lunch. Welcome. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so Matt and Nick, I want to hear first um, if you, uh, so Gabrielle introduced us to a, a wide range of things that both of you do, which are quite impressive. Uh, but I want to know about what is um, the most, uh, the, the thing that you're most focused on in your practice um, recently. Can you tell us about what what areas and kinds of things in your practice that you're focused on right now? I'm up, I think. Um, sorry. <laughs> uh, uh, hmm. I taught an animation workshop this morning. And um, you're going to have to mute. Right? And that was a 60 millimeter workshop. So uh, it was especially great work to practice on students to um, uh, think more deeply about residual media, um, the materiality of media, which we're losing dramatically, and uh, to really think about process instead of an end product, think about uh, that, that materiality, and to really try and remember where, where it is we've come from along the way. Was that animation workshop uh, analog or digital or both? Yeah, so full on analog. So yeah. we were uh, coloring and scratching and marking and painting on 60 millimeter clear leader. Mm. And, and uh, uh, each student had a couple of seconds, so 48 frames. And then we, were, we would splice it all together and then run it through the projector. So there was no computers involved at all, which was really good fun. And I think the students got a lot out of it too. I mean, that's something I've noticed over the years in, 16 years of teaching at Concordia in Montreal is that there was a there was a moment early on where I found new media digital media absolutely exhausting there were uh, <laughs> it's it was always the latest software it was always the latest tools without much regard I think for output and with a kind of a historicism that bothered me a lot and I think it's only in the last six or seven years that I've noticed working with the students you know year in year out as new students come through new generations that they're actually getting that exhaustion too. They're actually finding themselves wanting to work with material artifacts. Mm -hmm. So whether it's the old signs that I have on the walls around the building, or it's working with 16 millimeter and markers, or whether it's using glue guns and old DX session books, um, I think I think there's a, a lot of excitement about that. About a um, okay. So uh, I want to I, I want to get back to. Uh, a little discussion about your practice, Matt. But first, I want to hear from Nick um, about what, yeah, what it, what area of your practice are you um, most focused on right now, Nick? Yeah. Um, so, I guess one of the, the most recent projects um, I've got echo to. Oh, so I think Nick, you have to unmute. All right, are we good there now? There you I think go. We should yes. be good. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Um, yeah, yeah, of course. Uh, I'm sorry for the little hiccup here. Um, so the the one of the kind of more recent projects that I've been working on, sort of expanding um, the work that I've been doing with birds flying into windows, um, is understanding um, the breeding birds um, in my home city of Pittsburgh. And um, Pittsburgh uh, is a Rust Belt city. Um, industrialized and it had lost its industry and lost a big portion of its population. And there's a lot of really beautiful vacant land in Pittsburgh. And a lot of that has sort of returned to nature. And, you know, we have stands of like 60 year old forest in some areas um, in the city. And this has become really great habitat for uh, even forest birds. Um, 
over the summer, I documented wood thrushes breeding in the city of Pittsburgh, which is kind of really incredible. This is a, a typical forest bird. Um, so it's amazing that the, the forests are mature enough to, to accommodate these um, species. But because the city is growing um, and new developments are going up, there might be conflict between that new development and these kind of vacant areas um, that have a lot of lovely forest in them. And so um, I'm hoping to kind of do these breeding bird um, surveys um, over the next few years to kind of use that as um, leverage for some policy change in the city of Pittsburgh um, to encourage bird safe design standards and to, and to focus in particular bird safe design standards on new buildings that are built adjacent to these um, really beautiful um, forested areas um, to uh, protect those birds um, so that when they do leave that forest, they don't collide into the, the windows um, of the buildings that are, are coming up. So um, sort of interesting role as an architect to be um, kind of immersed in, in kind of avian field biology. Um, and to uh, kind of practice scientific method, um, which um, has been a lot of fun recently. Can uh, so. can you connect uh, that uh, field work, which is itself kind of profoundly analog? Um, can you perhaps draw a, a, um, a sort of parallel to what Matt was talking about in terms of tensions between analog work and digital work? Yeah. Um, so. Yeah, interesting. I mean, the work, as you as you mentioned, has been exclusively um, has been exclusively analog. I would love the idea of like generating an app or something that would allow folks to maybe like find um, the birds that are breeding in in Pittsburgh. Um, and you know, in some cases, these are maybe sort of remote areas, but you know, a location aware app that could like begin to um, talk about the bird life that is around the city of Pittsburgh beyond the things that are very visible, like crows and mm -hmm. house sparrows um, would be, um, would be really amazing. So I, I guess that kind of touches a little bit on, um, on that conversation. But. Nick, I'm curious, how big of a problem, can you like quantify this birds flying into windows problem? Like how, how yeah, like I I'm trying to understand like what is the the magnitude of this yeah. uh, issue? Yeah, it's it's pretty significant, um, and it's up to a billion birds. Um, so be uh, die every year because they fly into buildings in um, the wow. United States and Canada. So um, it's it's significant. Um, there's only one thing that that uh, is. Uh, kills more birds than than buildings do, and that's um, domestic cats who are allowed to <laughs> who are allowed to roam. Yeah, yeah, it's funny, but it's you know, it's the number's like three three billion. It's like oh my god, wow. every you know those cute cats that are outside, um, and people joke about it too. Like you know, everyone has a friend whose cat is outside, and like you know, pulls a, a bird out of the habitat like every other day. It's mm -hmm. kind of it's kind of alarming. Um, those add up. And uh, birds are kind of under like steep decline for a lot of different reasons. And cats and buildings together combi uh, combined like account for um, a lot of that. Habitat fragmentation, climate change, these are all other issues. But buildings um, and cats in particular um, are, are, are pretty, pretty dangerous and lethal to them. So um, it also is connected to materiality, isn't it? I mean, this problem yeah. it, it, it's less the height than the actual glass skin, so we can assume it's a kind of post-World War II phenomenon. Yes, exactly. And and birds aren't hitting like skyscrapers at the kind of, you know, upper stories of of those buildings. The collisions really happen. There's a sort of, you know, what we call the collision zone. Um, and, you know, this is typically within the first few stories of a building because that's where the vegetation is at. And so what is sort of happening is that birds are foraging um, in, um, in trees and shrubs and bushes and, um, you know, they're actively eating. If it's migration, they're eating a lot so that they can store up fat reserves to complete another migratory leap. Um, and they like turn and see the reflections of their habitat in in the in the glass um, in the glass of buildings, and of course, sustainability sustainable buildings deploy a lot of a lot of glass. Um, 
and they get tricked. They see more trees and, and presume that they can fly into that. And it's, it's not actual space. And then the collision occurs. So they see very literally um, and, and get tricked in that way. So uh, that collision zone is, is usually like, you know, sort of maxes out at the top of, of the vegetation that, that's around, around the buildings. Which in some ways is, uh, is not infrequently the zone where conventionally signage used to occur. Uh, yeah. And I'm wondering if, if both of you could um, uh, address this question of um, environmental design uh, in a general sense and sort of how, uh, as you both came into design, uh, how you gradually turned your attention to these larger questions of the environment, however one chooses to define that. Yeah, I'll pick that up if I may. Uh, I, I mean, a lot of the things that Nick is saying right now are familiar to me only because I had the pleasure of attending his talk last night where he covered off a lot of these issues. And uh, it was one of those moments where you really have to, um, a kind of epiphany where you really have to start to rethink the work that you've done up until that point. And uh, I mean, I would say with the Montreal Science Project, you know, which has been going since 2011, you know, signs are indifferent or perhaps even hostile to birds, depending on their design. I mean, that's clearly something I'm going to have to think about in the future. Um, the biggest connection for me is that uh, some of the signs that I have in the collection, uh, well, there are two ways to think about it. One is that um, some of the signs that we've we've salvaged in the raceways behind the, the the lettering or the characters or whatever are is the detritus of you know 50 or 60 years in a in a in a, a city in which th there are extremes of uh, climate. And, uh, you know, we pull out, unfortunately, uh, the remains of dead birds and birds' nests and all kinds of stuff from inside those things. So in a way, and they, they, they often have, the older ones often have, um, you know, uh, bird uh, anti-nesting devices on them, you know, which are just uh, very crass. They're just uh, just spikes on top of them you mm. know, to stop birds settling on them. And then, you know, the, 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 the debris from the birds that then uh, gets in the way. So that's one way of thinking about it. But the other one is that... Um, some of the signs we have in the collection come from the uh, the Mirabel uh, International Airport, which was a, a white elephant in Montreal. It opened in 1975, a huge uh, rectangular smoke glass passenger terminal building. Um, the whole thing was all over by 2004, at least for passenger traffic. And uh, in 2016, the, um, the terminal building itself with all the smoke glass was uh, demolished. So... I have to rethink that. I have to think about that terminal building in terms of its uh, the, the danger it poses to birds. But more importantly, as we were taking those some of those signs away to work with them in the collection uh, in all kinds of uh, interesting ways, I think, um, we also found in the research that um, they had been using uh, something called alpha chlorolose uh, to control. Well, this is actually a headline from the, from the time. Experiments with alpha chlorolose uh, uh, used to, d to control harmful birds. And I think that's, uh, that's from 1977. I mean, the, the, the rhetorical slippage there that, that, that birds are harmful to, uh, to aeroplanes and maybe not the other way around is quite extraordinary. But that, again, that's, a, that's another avenue that occurred to me last night as I was listening to Nick's talk. Um, I'll pass you back to Nick. Thank you. Yeah, I, you know, yeah, what are the the sort of I guess you know thinking a little bit more about the collisions and signage and you know the I'm thinking a lot about the role of light that um, and the yeah the role of uh, um, artificial light plays in this whole conversation and um, you know a lot of migratory birds in particular come into cities because they are attracted to light like insects are um, and so they are flying at night when they're migrating between their breeding grounds and their wintering grounds. And for example, coming up the Eastern seaboard, they're gonna encounter New York City. And all of that light pollution from the city disrupts kind of darkness and that confuses them. And then they come down into the city and then they find localized areas of light pollution. So kind of thinking a little bit about signage, um, you know, there are records of uh, huge bird collisions happening on communication towers and on lit signage in particular. Um, um, historically that uh, have killed um, killed hundreds of birds. There's a story of a, 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 a lit cross um, outside of Pittsburgh on a hilltop for a church that killed something like 1,200 oven birds um, in one night because they were flying in mass. So 
um, you know, I feel like light, light in many ways is is a part of this conversation also. And um, you know, the the light pollution that our our settlements and our cities emit um, is um, is significant. So, and you know, as you guys continue this work, um, one wonders how you position it. Uh, Matt, is your is your work on signage? Um, is it is it about documenting, let's say, uh, graphic design in the environment, or is it is it about the discourse of what we might want to call environmental design? And the same thing for you, Nick. Do you see this as um, architecture in response to the environment, or is it about attempting to create a more holistic or uh, way of thinking about the what sometimes are um, disciplinary silos that exist. Can you mm. sort of comment on that? How should we be thinking about this in, in, in 2019? And I don't necessarily mean it only in the sense of um, problematizing or say the, the negative impact of, of signs and buildings on the natural realm, but just what does it mean to be taking these questions in with respect to design and the environment in 2019? And should we be reframing our discourse to account for that? Yeah. Um, I mean, one of, the, one of the interesting things is the, this kind of notion of like unintended consequences, right? I don't think that we think enough about the impact that um, our designs have, um, thinking about the long view. And so oftentimes we are like doing things to solve immediate problems. Good example of this is, is green roofs in architecture, right? Which are um, um, really great building elements. They uh, help deal with uh, issues around water, um, they help uh, insulate buildings, they help beautify buildings and allow for us to have green space um, in very urban environments. But for birds in particular, we're knowing we're, we're beginning to understand that these green roofs are, are what's called stopover habitat. And so as birds are migrating, they're using these green roofs because they're you know, nice insects on them and they're eating and they're able to um, fatten up a little bit to complete their, their migratory journey. But that puts them into very lethal pro like proximity to other buildings. Um, and those other buildings aren't um, Are we having a lag with Nick? I think we are. Matt, if you're unfrozen, you could uh, answer this question while while we sort of get Nick caught up. I'm frozen on screen. Oh, there you go. I, I think I froze. Yeah, you did. Yes. Welcome back. Welcome back. Oh no, I don't know where I. I don't know at what point I froze, but um, the other buildings are are lethal. Yes. The the other buildings are right. The other bu buildings are lethal because of um, the the presence of the green intended consequence of something that is kind of seen as very positive. Um, and so, I'm not advocating for green roofs to go away, but I am advocating for a better understanding of how to design green roofs so that birds are protected once they're on them from their surroundings. You know, it's hard to anticipate, you know, you can't anticipate everything, but I, I think that every, every good design should at least be thinking a little bit beyond the immediacy of, um, of the moment. I think we're a little bit too good at um, thinking about things um, in the present without accounting for that kind of, that kind of longer view and, and what else may, uh, may happen as a, as a result of our um, creative process. Mm, yeah, that's the condition of the Anthropocene, is it not? <laughs> yeah. In terms of this, this question of uh, perhaps a new discourse for design and in the environment. Yeah, I, um, can you, you, I, uh, uh, I did a dissertation on gra the politics of graphic design practice, um, in, uh, which I finished in 2002. And I was very, very interested in the, the, the sort of boundaries of what was possible in graphic design practice in the context of uh, pressing political and cultural issues. And um, I'm, not, I'm not sure how much we've achieved. I think I, I, I find uh, graphic designers uh, 
wonderful, amenable, thoughtful, generally liberal to progressive folks, but I think there's something about design that's kind of sticky in the sense of trying to move a debate forward. A, a case in point was the First Things First manifesto, uh, you know, which came out in the 60s with Ken Garland, and then a, a, a sort of a new version came out um, uh, in late 1990s, and um, I was able to track that too, and I was seeing that Again, a lot of really great intentions, but a lot of it was just getting um, stuck in the mud because uh, it was, you know, we need to do better. Well, you're just the graphic design elite talking. Um, we, we, we No, but we all need to do better. And then, a, you know, a, a, a signatory would say, well, actually, you know, I've sinned, uh, haven't you? You know, so there was sort of, there was some soul searching, soul searching going on, but it, I found it incredibly frustrating in terms of trying to move the debate forward. I think we all, and I'll, I'll include myself in that, have a sense, a, a kind of cultural amnesia around these debates. I mean, a, another really good example is when I was working in professional graphic design practice in the late 80s in London, um, everybody was talking about environmentalism. Everybody was talking about sustainability. Uh, every client wanted, you know, non-gloss uh, papers with and, and stock with, with recycled materials in them. It didn't matter too much how much recycled materials. People were making stuff for clients with, you know, un, uh, uncoated stock and twigs and stuff. But, you know, then it was a style and it was a fashion and it kind of went away. So if there's a question about sustainability and design and which belongs inside the other one, I think, you know, if Greta Thunberg can can tell us anything, if we can learn anything from her, it's that it, this is this is a matter of extraordinary urgency, and uh, uh, we're not doing enough. You know, I think that's I think whatever we think we're doing, if we think we're doing enough, we think we're doing too, we're not doing enough, mm -hmm. not at all, never. Yeah. That's so that. I mean, in some ways, it does then suggest that this, if ever there was a moment to break down disciplinary and discursive boundaries, this is it because even in just in this discussion, we're seeing the kind of overlaps that exist. Um, I had been thinking about that from a match to a city <clears throat> thing that gets that phrase. Is it Raymond Lowy? I can't remember. I think it might be uh, to, to um, articulate the different scales of design, but maybe now we have a, we, we need to have a much more kind of political understanding of that. Um, yeah. yeah. I mean, what comes to mind, uh, and this is not to, steal something that we we shouldn't be stealing but i, I think uh you know the, the folks those of us who are following identity politics uh, at the moment um the term intersectionality is terribly terribly important mm -hmm. um in, especially in terms of uh, uh you know the experience of african americans at this point in the united history of the united states um i wonder if there's a way to think about uh you know an intersectional approach to design that that works much harder to connect the dots you know, um, if I'm somebody who can be interested in signs and hasn't really thought about birds, you know, um, that's a problem. Uh, uh, you know, Nick is, is, is in his work, I think, has has made one of those connections, you know, one of those intersectional connections between architecture and the plight of birds. Mm -hmm. I mean, some of the slides Nick was showing last night are just absolutely horrendous. There was a, a, a photograph of uh, a bunch of birds, the, the dead birds that had been collected in, in, in a short period of time from one building in Toronto. And there were hundreds of these things, hundreds of them. And it's, I was appalled, mm -hmm. but uh, yes. So we need to do more for sure, for sure. So I think that's, I, oh, please, Jimmy. Um, I, so Nick mentioned earlier something that I thought was really interesting that these birds are flying into buildings because it's reflecting the, the trees and they, they have a kind of, they're looking at it like it's an extension of nature, but it's actually not, mm -hmm. um, which makes me think about, and you know, Matt, you just mentioned like, you know, seeing images of these birds um, is like horrendous. Um, I, I wonder about what, you know, if we're talking about intersectionality within design, like what might the role of images be? Um, in addressing some of these problems, like Nick, for you, like, like, can we make birds see differently? And and Matt, can we make people see differently? <laughs> yeah, uh, it's an interesting question. I, you know, we 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 can't make birds see differently. It'd be great if we could outfit them with little tiny goggles to, to kind of navigate that. I mean, but can we show them differently, right? Like, right. can we make buildings so that they see differently? 
I mean, absolutely. So the, the, like the technologies that are out there, um, a lot of them um, are about uh, putting signals on glass that that tells the bird that it can't it can't fly towards that habitat um, that it's seeing as as reflection. Um, unfortunately, birds are really good at navigating tiny spaces, and so whatever is put on top of the glass to kind of break up the reflection has to be very dense and has to be very visible. Mm-hmm. And humans don't like. Their, their views interrupted, right? This is sort of like <laughs> this like assumption, right? That like, we're gonna put something over top of the glass and our and our, our view is going to be ruined. Um, this is sort of like the, the, the biggest um, kind of fear of, of a building owner or, you know, a homeowner, whoever is trying to make an attempt at, at creating a bird safe building. Mm. And there are sort of more invisible kind of UV reflective films that you can um, buy, um, th- those types of window systems are very e- expensive and they don't always perform for a lot of reasons, um, especially in cloudy climates. Mm-hmm. Um, you really need a lot of UV present in order to activate that pattern in the glass to break up the reflections. So more three-dimensional signage um, and interventions, however you want to think about it, um, are, are really important. And and for me, it's you know kind of, you know, I, I guess, you know, one of the things that I like to, to, to tell folks is that, like, in the same way that our sense of smell, you know, we adjust um, when we enter a room and there's a mm. scent there, you know, our, our, our bodies adjust to that. And within a couple of moments, we, we forget about it. The same thing happens when you put a visual intervention over top of a window. Mm-hmm. Um, oh. Your eyes do adjust. And I think for me as an architect, what's exciting is when you begin to think about those patterns, um, and you think maybe begin to think about screens um, as installations on top of buildings, armatures, um, things that could maybe help the building perform also. If that's part of the same design language, you really you really kind of get this understanding that it's 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 more about the um, it, it works with the building and is not is not a negative. It's not something that like has to be randomly applied in order to prevent birds from flying into the window. Like there's this kind of assumption that it it's you know a bunch of stickers on on the glass and it doesn't have to be that. Um, Bring back the breeze soleil. The a breeze soleil, exactly. Bird soleil. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean I, mean, I love this the other idea. kind of yeah, one of the other kind of products that I like is like the bus wrap, right? This is that product that you see on buses, right? Where you can see out of it, but you can't see into it. Um, um, and so that's a really great product, you know, and and as, actually has some performative aspects to it too, because it can help thermoregulate in some cases um, when mm-hmm. it's needed. Um, and the graphic that's on the outside of that that product, you know, there's opportunity there to design it. Um, and I think that's that's really exciting also. I mean, I, I think I'd call that like a, um, uh, what, I feel like I ran across this term one time called graphic skin. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I like to think of the building as having a graphic skin of some sort that is not glass, but yeah, but actual graphic. Yeah. Um, yeah. And there's lots of products out there that, that can do that. I mean, you can get sort of laser etched um, glass. You can apply finishes to glass ceramic fritz can be baked on in certain patterns um um, there's acid etching um so there are a lot of really great products out there that can uh really um kind of expand this idea of kind of a graphic nature to a building a building thus dissolving uh once again the the boundaries between uh between graphic design and uh three-dimensional and architectural design Absolutely. Uh, I yeah. think I think we we there is a project here on intersectionality and in design that that uh, we <laughs> you all need to take on. Clearly. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it, you know, it is interesting. I um I reread Women, Race, and Class, uh, uh-huh. which I hadn't read since college, and recently, and I was well, aside from being astonished at how r- relevant it was, what I had not remembered about the book is that. It is, in fact, a history. Hmm. Uh, chapter by chapter, it moves, it moves forward the, in the history of the United States and kind of before it was the United States. And so when one thinks about what the intersectionality of design looks like, if one uses Angela Davis as a model, I think it's much more doable than we might think hmm. uh, because of the way that she periodizes uh, stepping us through each of these, each of these um, moments. And there are no images 
that's really also a really interesting question to your point, Jimmy. Mm-hmm. Uh, as you were bringing that up about kind of images of, of bird building carnage, I kept thinking of the ways in which um, was it in the 90s that there was this um, use of uh, images for spectacle, images of violence, images uh, that were, were deployed um, <laughs> for spectacle, claiming to have a political agenda, but not necessarily, not necessarily always successfully weighing the difference between reveling in the violence of the image and the supposed message that was, uh, that was being, um, that was being put forward. Uh, and of course I'm blanking Benetton. What were those? Oh, colors. Um, Colors. Typer Coleman uh, did colors magazine for for a long time. And, you know, I was actually just, doing a lecture about this the other day so it's fresh on my mind but you know like there was this strange tension for him between like making this magazine that was about the um uh, almost subcultures of the world um but it was funded by united colors of benetton there was like this strange tension there but he um there's this interview where he talks about how that actually he's like fuck that um i it does not matter like this this these images are real it is out there does it really matter who paid for the printing i don't know um but yeah uh yes but that that reference to uh to colors and that um publication is actually um a great moment to bring us to um what probably is going to be one of our last questions which is what are you gentlemen reading these days? One of the things we'd like to do is uh, is hear what, what's on your reading list, what's on your bedside table, because uh, um, it's always uh, incredibly useful for, for us and for our viewers. Matt, do you want to go first? Sure, I'll go first. Yeah, um, I made some notes about this because I knew I'd... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> completely forget what I've read. Um, last semester, last year, with my grad students, we had a, a class on uh, what, we, what we're calling Canada Research Creation. So it's a way of connecting scholarship to media making, art practice. And we together we read Donna Haraway's new book, Staying with the Trouble, which was um, incredibly generative. Um, absolutely fantastic. Um, a go-to book for me at the moment is uh, Jussi Parika's uh, What is Media Archaeology? Um, I'm finding that very useful when I'm thinking about uh, residual media. Um, and what have I got to read that's on my stack? Uh, let's see, uh, two, three books. So um, next up will be Unlearning the City, Infrastructure in a New Optical Field by Swati uh, Chattopadhyay. Oh, um, Play. Excuse me? No, Ashanti will be happy to get that shout out. Oh, right, right on. Uh, Code and Clay, Data and Dirt, 5,000 Years of Urban Media, Shannon Manton. Um, and I would really like to read uh, the final part of the Wolf Hall trilogy by Hilary Mantel, if she'll only finish the book. <laughs> it's due in the spring, I think. Yeah. Yeah, so a nice, a nice mix there of, uh, <laughs> of, of uh, fiction and, uh, or historical fiction and, uh, yeah. and uh, other. If I can get to it. Yeah. I, I must just um, interject, please, if, you, if you'll allow. Um, there seemed to be a little bit of a take up in the conversation about this idea of intersectionality. I, I, I think it's terribly, terribly important that we don't ever lose sight of where that term comes from and the work that it's doing, the incredible important work it's doing. So if we want to talk about intersectionality in the design context, it's absolutely imperative that that is a conversation also about identity. It's a conversation about yeah. color. It's a conversation about race, sexuality, gender, um, all those kinds of dimensions that we, we as designers politely set aside. Uh, a lot of the time, we're all a little bit uncomfortable talking about. I think that's not here on Universal Lunch. Nope. <laughs> I'm delighted to hear that, Jimmy. <laughs> These here queers like to talk about identity. Rock on! I'm there. <laughs> Nick, Thanks. how about you? What, what are you What are you reading these days? Uh, I have three things on the docket right now. Um, so one of the things I'm reading, The Air from Other Planets, which is this book on invisibility and in architecture by a guy named Sean Lally. Um, which talks a lot about um, energy in architecture and spaces that are defined by things that are invisible, like heat um, and um, cold air and moving air. And it's a really beautiful um, kind of account of uh, how we can 
get architectural experiences from the invisible world. Um, I'm reading um, a natural history uh, of shorebirds called The Windbirds by a naturalist named Peter Matheson, um, who uh, sort of um, uh, describe shorebirds and their ecology, but in sort of very descriptive experiential ways. Um, and so I really kind of like the kind of scientific data that can be, um, that can be learned from a descriptive account of something. So this is at its core, like, you know, one of the definitions of naturalism is that our experience of something and the documentation of it is, um, is data and is science. Um, so, uh, shorebirds are sort of, have been on my mind lately because of their really kind of epic migrations. Um, they go from, in some, some of them go from as far as the kind of Arctic all the way down to Patagonia in South mm. America. So they, um, traverse thousands of miles, mm. um, in, in one season. So I'm reading that and I'm reading a book, um, by an architect named Craig Wilkins mm -hmm. um, called The Aesthetics of Equity, Notes of Race, Space, Architecture, and Music. Um, so lots of really kind of great um, great topics in there, timely topics. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I'm just sort of starting that um, for a class that I'm gonna, that I'm teaching currently mm -hmm. at Chatham. Um, but that's not, a, that's not a new book, is it? It's not a new book, yeah. no, yeah. no. But it is sort of uh, newer um, to talk about uh, issues of race, class, and queerness mm -hmm. in an architecture studio. Um, yes. And so uh, I'm grateful for the opportunity right now. At Chatham, I'm teaching this class, which is um, an architecture theory course. Um, it's architecture theory in studio. And mm -hmm. so we are reading um, and writing, but then also expanding upon what we read and write into um, into into making also, so putting putting that to use. Um, so those are the, the three things that I've been reading. Um, uh, I guess also, also diverse um, in terms of topic, but um, yeah, uh, you know, to kind of pick up a little bit about Matt was saying about intersectionality and, um, you know, you know, in architecture, I don't think we talk enough about um, kind of, you know, human issues related to um, some of these ideas that we're touching on race, class, sexuality, feminism. So, um, I think really important and also kind of defining um, sustainability, which has come up um, today also mm -hmm. and thinking about what sustainable design is, um, what sustainable architecture is, and it not just being about energy and uh, nice eco-friendly materials, um, but creating spaces for uh, birds and, and, and people. Mm -hmm. um, so. Great. Well, thank you both so much. Yeah. For, uh, for joining us for Universal Lunch today. Um, I, uh, I all, on a personal note, I'm going to say that I'm looking forward to seeing you both in person yeah. since uh, I'm about to uh, pack up here and get on a plane to join you while I'm in Portland. Uh, Sounds good. So uh, this, these conversations will be continued in, in, a, in an old-fashioned analog face-to-face uh, -face over, the, <laughs> over the weekend. Uh, <laughs> So thank you both very much, uh, yeah. Matt Sor and Nick Liadis, for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Brielle, uh, please tell our viewers about um, the reason why you are going to Portland in a few moments. Yes, indeed. Well, uh, as, uh, as part of the Design Inquiry Future Perspective, um, as I think we've mentioned on previous weeks, there are a number of exciting activities that are that are going on, various workshops, various lectures, artists in residence. Uh, and this weekend uh, on Saturday, we are holding the first ever, perhaps never to be repeated, uh, design <laughs> inquiry, future perspective convivium. What is a convivium? you might ask. Um, it's, it's like a symposium, only it's friendlier. Uh, it turns out that the, in the ancient world, there was something called a convivium that the Romans developed uh, oh. after the Greek symposium. Basically the same thing, except women were allowed, which was oh. the case in the symposium. Uh, and, Typical. Uh, and apparently it was a little bit less Ideas were still discussed in the way we think of a classic symposium, but it was it was 
more convivial. Uh, so, uh, so our convivium is modeled on that. It, it, uh, as with everything else at the future perspective, it asks that same simple question. Uh, what does it mean to rethink the past and the present to point to the future? We've got 20 folks who are going to be presenting tomorrow, um, both in person at the ICA, but also, um, at a distance, uh, it's not going to be live stream, but we will be recording and then um, and then posting uh, posting an edited version of that. So we hope that you'll uh, you'll all join us uh, to view that later on. Um, and it should be a really a really exciting time. The one other thing I'll say about it, just to kind of whet people's appetites, is because you might be thinking, oh no, an academic day long conference. Um, uh, folks are presenting one hundred word papers. Uh, oh, so yes. just to be clear, it's, and I apologize for once again, my landline going off your analog my phone. Analog <laughs> phone. Um, uh, yeah. Okay. So a hundred <laughs> word, um, a hundred word papers, uh, which will allow for far more uh, time for discussion, uh, et cetera. So that's what's happening at the ICA on Saturday. So stay tuned, uh, on uh, Design Inquiry's YouTube channel for, uh, for, um, evidence of that event. Can you tell us quickly some of the people who will be joining you? Can uh, do you have uh, a, a list, well, a, a mental list? Uh, I do, I do. Um, I can tell you that we have uh, a number of people joining us from Texas, from Chris Taylor's yes. Land Arts of the American West. Shout out uh, to Chris Taylor, who are going to be joining us both at a distance and in person. Uh, Anita Cooney, uh, Dean of Design at Pratt, and Denise Gonzalez-Crisp, uh, Professor of Graphic Design uh, at NC State University, are going to be joining us as respondents. Uh, oh. We have um, a wide array of, uh, of thinkers and makers, young architects and graphic designers, like all the way from people who graduated from college a few years ago and are out there in the world to um, emerita professors. So uh, it's a, it's, I, I think going to be a really exciting day of, uh, of donuts and, pizza, uh, in, in, for those, for those who are present, all of the good ingredients yes. for being convivial. Yes. Um, absolutely. and before and we leave, today, next oh, go week, ahead. Next yes. week. Uh, yes. Next week. Uh, we, uh, universal lunch is turning extra political next week. We have joining us Danielle Aubert and Tuan Fon, both, um, I believe, in the socialist democratic camp. Um, so they're going to be talking about design in relation to um, this our current state of politics. Um, and then we're going to have fun and games with Trisha, Tracy, and Arzu Ozcal, who will be... Um, in residence at uh, Future Perspective. Um, I am so excited to talk to those two. They're gonna be fun. Yes, uh, so, so much to look forward to, both this weekend and next week. Uh, but in the meantime, I'm Gabrielle Esperdy in New York. And I am Jimmy Liu in Austin, Texas. And this has been Universal Lunch, Out of Office, Uncommon Hours. Thanks a lot. <laughs>